Hello everybody, it's Kenneth from the Archives here with another video delving into Dundee's past. In several of my previous videos, we've looked at buildings and structures which have disappeared from Dundee. And today we're going to be looking at what is probably the most iconic and famous lost Dundee building, Dundee Town House. Dundee Town House was built in the 1730s and designed by the renowned architect William Adam of the famous Adam family. The town house was very much a symbol of Dundee during its lifetime. It was designed so its spire could be seen by visitors approaching the town, whether it be by land or by sea, and was slap bang in the centre of the historic borough. It was also a building that histories of Dundee always tended to record, or guides to Dundee always tended to record in their descriptions and via illustrations. And we've got a couple of examples here. As you can see from the pictures, it was a very attractive building. It was a striking building. But sadly, in 1932, it was demolished. Now, 1932, obviously now, is almost 100 years ago. And so there are very few people in Dundee today who can actually say, we remember seeing the townhouse. Despite that, it's still very famous in Dundee today. And if you ask people in Dundee to name a lost building, this is the one that they will come up with. The other possibility is the Royal Arch, but in terms of actual buildings, it would be the townhouse. Now, this is remarkable if you think about it and shows the sort of deep impression it's made. So why did it go? Now, in previous videos, I've looked at the 1871 Improvement Act and its consequences, and we've also looked at James Thompson's plans for Dundee in 1910. As I've made clear, by this point, there were already serious questions about the townhouse's future. There had been proposals to redevelop it. There had been proposals to tear it down, basically because it was seen as old fashioned, not in the best of condition and not befitting a city of Dundee's status. Thompson's 1910 plan, as the map shows, originally was going to leave the townhouse where it was, although Thompson himself seems to have been fairly ambivalent about its fate. After the First World War, Thompson came back with another stab, and indeed a much more radical plan for the redevelopment of Dundee. And as we can see from this picture on the right, this time his suggestion was that the townhouse be moved. So it would be taken away from its place in the centre of Dundee, blocking the new city square, as we've been accused of doing, and moved a little bit along to where the Overgate Centre now is, occupying space between Overgate and the High Street, really taking up the role that Union Hall had once held. Now, a charge is often levelled against Thompson, as it were, that his ideas are not that practical. And the practicality of this is open to question. It's important to remember, though, that this was just one part of a much, much bigger report, and this was far more ambitious than Thompson's earlier scheme, including, as it did, a T Road bridge to be built on the stumps of the 1870s rail bridge, which, of course, had famously collapsed. A ring road, which was partly realised as the Kingsway, connecting Dundee to a national highway system, massive land reclamation, massive development of the tram network, connecting up the city's parks by what he called parkways and green spaces, and all things like this. And of course, again, money was a big obstacle, so an awful lot of these plans just didn't happen. What did come out of his report, though, were improvements to housing, and indeed, housing was seen as the key issue in Dundee after the First World War. And Dundee, of course, gets the first council housing scheme in Scotland, the Logie council housing scheme, followed later by schemes at Tay Bank, Craigie Bank, among others. And if you want to know more about Logie, our friends at Dundee City Archives have done a tremendous amount of work on that, and I suggest you check out their website. But this meant the poor old townhouse's fate was very much up in the air. And for much of the 1920s, it could be said there was indecision about what to do. The townhouse had its champions, notably A.H. Miller, the borough librarian and museum curator, who championed its survival and indeed claimed that James Caird had said on his deathbed that, OK, Mr. Miller, the townhouse should stay, um, though that he was unable to verify this. 
the artist Stuart Carmichael was another champion of it, seeing it as a significant building and admiring its beauty. But others, including councillors and civic officials, felt it was blocking off the new city square, felt it was something that needed to go. But the council kind of always hesitated about taking the decision, giving you an idea that they knew whatever they decided was going to be controversial. But in 1931, matters were taken out of their hands, it seemed, because on the 28th of December 1931, an emergency council meeting is called. And the reason being, it, bits have started falling off the townhouse, and it has been concluded that the townhouse is an imminent danger to life, and therefore the council decide to demolish it. They were going to start by taking down the spire, and indeed works on that starts fairly quickly, as that was the bit that was seen as really dangerous, and it was then proposed that the rest of the building would be removed. Now, as you might expect, there was a backlash to this. There was also support, and there was a lot of journalism, letters being written, discussions going on about what should happen. One of the more interesting ideas proposed by an anonymous letter writer in early January was that this here, the buildings at the front of University College, where the tower building now stand, they should be taken down. They've never really been seen as a suitable long-term solution for the college. And the townhouse should be re-erected here as the new grand building of University College, which was celebrating its 50th anniversary. Uh, however, how serious that idea is, is open to question, and in practical terms, is really open to question. Another connection with the archive, as you know, we've got Joseph Johnson Lee's archives. And although Lee wasn't living in Dundee at this time, he makes a return to life in Dundee by writing to the Courier to advocate the townhouse's retention. Interestingly, being described as Joseph Lee, late sergeant of the 4th, 5th Black Watch, Dundee's local regiment, which Lee had served in. But of course, he'd then gone on to be a lieutenant in another regiment. He's obviously wanted to emphasise his local credentials. He also reprinted his 1915 poem, In the Trenches, which uses the pillars as a Dundee landmark that people would recognise as part of the context of the poem. And the pillars were what generations of Dundonians called the townhouse. In fact, you will actually sometimes see books not referring to as the townhouse, but as the pillars. Interesting that Lee should do this. My suspicion is that Stuart Carmichael, being a friend of Lee's and an advocate of retaining the townhouse, put him up to doing this, but we can't know that for sure. Another group who we know were concerned from their minutes which we hold were the Dundee Institute of Architects. And you can see here their members expressed the opinion that the townhouse was a building of outstanding architectural interest and unique in Scotland, and it was a matter of national interest that it be retained. And this was a resolution that was sent to the town council who the next day were having a debate on the future, as Lord Provost Johnson was not entirely happy about the demolition and wanted a debate to see if anything could be done. Now, I should point out that although this was the resolution the Institute of Architects adopted, two of its members didn't go along with it. Robert Scrimger, who was a town councillor, and interestingly enough, Frank Thompson, who was James Thompson, who was dead by that point, son and fellow architect. But the rest of the Institute of Architects did go along with it. Well, the debate happened on the 28th of January 1932 at the Council, and it was heavily lost by the supporters of the townhouse. Only six councillors backed the retention, Lord Provost Johnson being one of them. And some of those that did back the retention wasn't on architectural merits. It was because they feel there could be legal complications. One of the th issues had been that the, we didn't have a listing system quite as we had today, but there was an ancient monuments board and the government department, the Department of Works, who were supposed to look after ancient buildings, and they didn't want the townhouse getting demolished. The council was able to argue, however, because it started taking down the spire, that the building was no longer in its original state, therefore it could proceed to demolition. And there had been some concern about this argument. but. The Ministry of Works did admit it was powerless to stop it. There were some very interesting arguments made at this council debate, but what comes out of it is there was a strong local feeling, actually, that the building should go. One of the most 
Auntie Townhouse voices was John Finn, who later would become Sir John Finn and Lord Provost of the city. And letters to the press at the time suggest that most people backed Finn's position. Now, partly this is to do with the fact they felt the building was ugly, but it's also to do with the fact that you've got to remember in the winter of 1932, we're in a massive depression and the demolition of the townhouse would provide work for people that otherwise might not have had work. So although, as the picture on the left shows, the city square had started to take shape around it, and actually, in fact, it could have been left from an architectural point of view and the city square still been there, that wasn't the way it was seen. And that we end up with the view of the city square that you see on the right, and the poor old townhouse was torn down. But it has a legacy. As I say, many people in Dundee today still have fond memories of it, despite the fact they never saw it and know it's a building. And if you go around the centre of town, you can actually see two very specific reminders of it. So the Pillars Bar in Crichton Street has a little model townhouse on it. And there is another model townhouse on what's called the townhouse clock on Gardine Land near to where the townhouse stood on the other side of the high street. So in a way, it's still there. Also, if you go to the McManus, there's a superb model of old Dundee, which includes the townhouse. So you can still sort of see it, which is nice. The interesting thing, though, for me is the memory. People think of it being a terrible act that this building was taken down. And it's a view I've got a lot of sympathy with. But if you look at it, in actual fact, had there been a plebiscite, a referendum in the 1930s, probably the majority of Dundonians would have supported it being taken down. And you might argue it's a relief that preservation of buildings now has much more importance today. OK, I hope you've enjoyed that video uh, and we'll be back with another video soon. In the meantime, take care.